Thank you very much. So, um, Michelle, um, the original bill is section one. I know that. It I is. Read that. Yep. And just um, so for the record, Michelle Child's Office of Legislative Counsel. And we're looking at the as passed by House. Are you looking at the that whole yep. big thing? Okay. So right, section one is just that. And so this is uh, in your statute section, with regard to release prior to trial. Section so. two and three are proposals from the Office of State's Attorneys. That you have on this new that we have on this, yep. a different on this one? Plan. Uh, yes, you should have, um, oh, you okay. should have this okay. passed by House, yeah. and, and then, then you also have something okay. with Eric's initials up top, yeah. okay. dated this morning. Okay, so two and three. Do you, do you want me to talk about Section 1 at all? Uh, well, I think that my understanding is all it does is codifies current law. Yes, current, <coughs> current practices. So there, you know, when you're, you're doing, when the judicial officer is doing. H, and as passed by the House, is, is, has. That's where they put 221 and 422 when they got all excited right. at um, town meeting break and decided that 221 wasn't strong enough and that 422 wasn't um, strong enough in terms of uh, the way they wanted it. So they revised 422 and 221 immediately in, the, in 675 um, and they passed them and then they announced at town meeting that they had passed them. Can I ask you a procedural question? I need to ask about the section. I thought there was some. I thought they were going to pass 221. As they're supposed to do it today. Okay, so they just have a couple if they changes. Get to committee. The only changes they have <laughs> is the are to take out the word. No, take oh. out the only changes they will have when the bill comes to the house floor will be that it'll be six months instead of 60 days. Okay up to six months and the word intended, intended. Is in that okay. other section and then according to Eric there are several technical amendments that he saw as he worked over the bill and those would be technical and it's not going to be a strike off so we get the clear and convincing evidence we have 422 which is constitutional five nothing okay over. but I'm not taking 422 up until they until they until they vote out 221. So my question is, why are we even looking at because this Because this is an opportunity. Section 1 codifies current law, and Section 2 and 3 are an opportunity to deal with school violence. So you're saying we're going to do a strike all? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Of, the, all right. of this, we're going to do a strike all of what? This, of oh, what this is the amendment did. that does the strike all. Yes. Right. Okay. So oh, okay. you don't have to all worry right. about it. I don't have to look at this okay. thing at right. all. I mean, you okay. have to know it is there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. What we're amending is I got it. Okay. what they did just before town meeting when okay. they decided they needed to pass something. And they came up with this bill. I think they just said, well, we need to do something. We have to have something to add it to. So they went ahead and did it. Oh, okay. Can you, um, oh, okay. I get okay. It. Can someone explain to me who, we, who qualifies as a defendant? Under this section, under one. section one, yeah. So this has to do with so when uh, someone is coming before uh, uh, the court for arraignment, for arraignment. so they've been okay, they've been charged, so they've been charged with a crime, and then the judicial officer goes through the analysis. First, they do and they look at whether or not you know what do they what conditions do they need to set to assure mm -hmm. the person's appearance at court for the next court hearing. Yeah. And then after, and they, there's a number of things they can do for that. Um, and then after that analysis, they go and they say, well, the conditions that we set there, are those enough to also protect the public from a, like a, any public safety you know, issue what, posed what, by what the defendant? What Pearson testified to <coughs> that they do routinely. Who comes under this? DUI people? No. So be, how do I know what this uh, well, is? Any, 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 this is any defendant. So it means a DUI person? No. Could mean it could, but it wouldn't necessarily. Right, I think there has to be some nexus between the gun. And right, we have to. The conditions of release have to be the least restrictive to basically get at what the goal is with regard to either you know your first analysis under uh, under assuring appearance and the second one for protecting the public. Um, a person generally? who committed an armed robbery, okay. a person who um, committed domestic assault, or threatened uh, or threatened right. domestic assault, a person who. Um, was involved in a drug deal where firearms were present. Right. If somebody's before the court be for a DUI, they're not going to... If it was a DUI and the guy pointed a gun at the police officer, oh, well, yeah. he might, okay. might, you know, okay, so that okay. might have been part of it. Okay. 
OK, so it has to have. Charged with something else. To have I can give you a copy of the underlying law if you want to see yes, that. Yes, yes, please. <coughs> Oh, okay. And so, Bill. Well, the only two requirements I'm familiar with are are they a risk of flight? Or are they a danger to the public? The word nexus, I like that word, but that's not what I understand to be part of the. On the underlying. Well, I can get you guys copies of what the underlying is. So, um, I think maybe Pepper can help there. I think so. Just so you know, that there is the, the, the general catch all for which they currently order this, which is just adding G in specific language, is that the language is that the court has general authority to impose any other condition found reasonably necessary to protect the public, except that a physically restrictive condition may only be imposed in extraordinary circumstances. Okay. But I think so, the victims of domestic violence, etc. But I, I, I want to go back and make clear the way that it's written right now. If for some reason or other, in a DWI defendant, the court's decided that this provision should apply, I don't know what that would be, but if the court's decided, <coughs> nothing prevents them from doing it now. But now you're codifying it and saying that they definitely do. Okay. Well, I'm uh, happy to hear from James. We're happy to continue to discuss this and make sure that it doesn't involve it. Um, I also just wanted to mention that uh, federal law specifies that federal uh, judicial officers have the ability to order a defendant not to possess a firearm or dangerous weapon as a condition of release when they're charged with a crime. So that's in the federal court. In federal court. Right. Yep. All right. Um, so, Michelle, would, um, would you prefer to have Mr. Pepper go over? Sure, that's fine. I just, Rather than you, I'm given fine. that you're pinch hitting for error. Sure. If the uh, if the language came from Pepper, I'm happy to have him talk. About I believe the language came from um, this office of state attorneys and sheriffs. If I'm not mistaken, tell me I'm correct. You're correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't want to do the wrong thing here. Okay, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and um, you're basically walking us through this and maybe explaining why it's necessary. Okay, and you're I'm looking at draft 1.1. 1. 1. Um, well, we have 1.2. Okay. Yeah. Is it Eric's draft? John, you yeah. 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 I think I might. I think John might uh, actually sit in on this. All right. Well, let John. Do that. <laughs> Third person. Try to help. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. We understand that you're busy upstairs too. Well, I was. <laughs> What'd they do? Throw you out? <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 well, the defense attorney statement. Whatever the house does up there on section eight is enforceable. So be prepared. Okay. What's section eight? Oh, section. Okay. That's the uh, yeah. the magazines. The magazines. Okay. Sports Illustrated time. Oh, really? God bless you. God bless you. Those kind of magazines, right? So John Campbell, uh, State Executive Director of the State Attorneys and Sheriffs, and um, I'm here just because uh, I've been asked to clarify to make sure that uh, it's certain times when I come to testify that uh, you realize I'm here as testifying on behalf of the state's attorneys. I do. Okay. And um, because our sheriffs have different opinions. I understand that. Okay. So, so here's what we tried to do. When, when all of this first happened, uh, when I say all this, when Parkland happened and there was a discussion as to combustion. Um, what could be done or what could we do to possibly prevent something like this happening in Vermont? Uh, we were went through the, the laws that we had currently on the books and, and um, we had this, uh, a couple of them that just did not fit correctly or fit well. And you know, we have uh, uh, the criminal threat <laughs> law, uh, criminal, there, there's my, my third one for the rest of the day, okay, Janet? So I won't no, no, all, feel rude. The older I get, the more they come in a row. My wife does six for <laughs> dinner or anything, and I'd say, uh, well, six one will be the charm. 
<laughs> By the time my dad died, he was doing 16. Oh, oh, well, allergies are starting, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yes, they are. This um, isn't valid. So anyway, we uh, we looked at in one of the areas we looked at was this uh, 4017, which we uh, had this uh, body had passed, and the, the, you guys you were actually uh, instrumental on this a few years back, and that is people prevented from having from possessing firearms, mm -hmm. and um, so we went around and around here, and uh, we felt that if we could possibly place this here um, in one section that the person being prohibited from possessing would be somebody who has made a uh, threat to uh, enter a school, made some type of communications to others, whether it be uh, communication through uh, text or, and that would be identified as you know, text or uh, Facebook or in person, that they're intended to uh, enter school grounds to um, and then go in here, either commit, uh, put it on the person uh, in uh, fear of imminent serious physical his, uh, injury or to commit or threaten to commit any crime of violence. This is one way, but I still think the best way, the better way, and we were working on this actually when you called, Senator, um, is under the criminal threatening statute. Uh, I think that there is language that we could put in there that would be a little more direct. This is um, the way we had it under 4017. I believe I believe it, it works, but you it's awkward uh, in how and it's attempt to do what we we all would like to do, and that is to say, if somebody um, has the intention to come on to a school ground uh, to uh, with a weapon, uh, whether it be a fire with a firearm in this case, uh, to cause physical injury. Uh, to another, then uh, we want to make sure we're able to prevent that. Where does it say that on the school ground? Um, this, as far as the, oh, I see two, but when you get to 2B, or you talk right. about that, 2B, commit or threat? That's the first one. Um, That's why I was saying it's a little awkward. 2B, it, yes, commit or threaten to commit any crime any, of violence. Any crime of violence. Is this, does it say only? In the school? Well, well it's using a firearm. You know, you're using a firearm to commit or threaten to commit any crime of violence. I think the um, if you're if you have a firearm and you're threatening uh, to uh, to to assault someone, to kill somebody, to maim somebody, I'm going to punch you out. Yeah, if you have a gun. No, it doesn't say that though, does it? No, it says so firearm. It you, says have a, you have to use a firearm you know, to. It says you can't possess one, but it doesn't say right. that you threaten with a gun. Uh, it says, line 16 off yeah. out. Yeah, it says for the purpose of using a firearm to A, place or attempt to place another person in fear of imminent service. For the purpose of using injury, a firearm. Oh, okay. And okay. the purpose of using a firearm to commit or threaten okay. to commit any crime of violence. Okay. So okay. You have to read the, yeah. the last sentence of. The yeah. last words of line 16. I'm using the firearm. Okay. So it, yeah. you know, it has to be on school buildings, yeah. school grounds, or an institution of higher education. <clears throat> okay. And then it is only effective if they, they place the person in fear of imminent serious physical injury or to commit any crime of violence. So taking this, yeah. let's, let's, see, let's say that you might have a different way of doing this, but yeah. taking this to the Sawyer case, this yeah. would provide a, given yeah. his journal and the comments he made. To the, give you a way. I, I will, um, if I could say this and actually be on the record, is that anything that I'm suggesting here today or that the state's attorneys will be suggesting um, has nothing to do uh, or is not intended to do anything with the Sawyer case or have um, any type of involvement. If the case. But I think what, what our purpose is, let me use Parkland or, or, or if some David similar Jones, cases. If like David that. Jones were to make an, a, a threat <laughs> and several students heard that threat, um, or he posted it on Facebook, whatever, that he, you know, and he had a bunch of firearms on his bed and took pictures of them. And then 
made and talked to several of the students about his plan and had a journal. This would come under. Yeah, it's basically it's almost backward, not backwards, but it's it's it, when I say awkward is it's really the communications. Let's take the communication first. He's got to be he or she has to have made the communication that they are going to go on to a school uh, to you know to do uh, commit uh, or threaten to commit bodily injury. Then the second part of this is that is that the, what so what this would say is that those people. Are not anybody who makes that kind of a threat is not allowed to possess a firearm. So uh, it would be the communications first. Then the the fact is, if they possess a firearm, then they uh, you know, then there's a, the penalty or there's the, the violation of law. So the violation is if they have the gun. Right. Exactly. So it's not it's not that's why it doesn't get into what I think is what we're trying to get at, um, and, and that is. Um, it, it, I mean, what happens if he just doesn't have the gun in his possession at the time, or she doesn't have the gun in his possession at the time? It's the only time this would come into effect is if we found somebody who made the threat and they had a possession of, of a weapon, of a firearm. So that's why, and I hate to, I wasn't sure that we were taking this up this morning. In fact, I didn't think, I thought you were just doing a walkthrough. But if it, what I'd like to present to you um, this afternoon, or not this afternoon, but whenever I believe you're coming back on this tomorrow. No, no, no. Tomorrow is all magazines. Um, is I could I could I believe the best way to deal with this is probably through the criminal threatening statute, as far as this part well, is concerned. We can take this up next week, um, but I'm a little. Okay. I there are I two. I think this. I realize this thing. You think it's awkward, but I think. It's I think it'll work. I'm just saying it's, yeah, I just think that there are some people that will, it will that might not, uh, well, you have to have a gun in order to threaten to use a gun. Yeah. Right? I can't threaten that I'm going to use a gun and my gun's in my garage back home. I can't threaten you with it right now because I don't have it. Well, you can you can make the threats, and that's the whole thing with the you know, with the criminal threatening is. Well, I'm going to get you this afternoon. But this doesn't this doesn't intervene really prior to you get the you get the penalty if you violate having a gun, right? Well, that's that's the. In other words, you can't grab you can't grab the person ahead of time. Well, 221 would let you grab the person. Yeah, 221. No, it wouldn't let you grab the person. It let you grab the gun. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But if you follow well, the language of the statute, you start with the title. And the title is persons who are yeah. prohibited from possessing firearms. If you're going to add this provision, I would suggest striking the words conviction of violent right. crime because that doesn't quite well, aid the flow of the statute. Yeah. Well, if that's the first person who is going to be deprived mm -hmm. is someone who is convicted of a violent crime, as is defined. 4017. The next question is who else is prohibited? And you don't necessarily have a conviction here if I'm seeing this right. At least not. You, you are. So you do need to be read. I'm, I'm thinking that it needs to be a little cleaner. I know where you're going and I appreciate where you're going. I want to go where you're going. I'm not reading it. And it leaves me comfortable okay. if you don't have the criminal threat so, concept behind it. If you have a rewrite for next Tuesday, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, I, I would definitely have that. Can we, can we go to the third part of this? The, the, <laughs> well, it's not. The third. It's section three, so it is the third part. This was added by uh, Representative Vianz in in the actual bill that passed the House. No, it did not pass in anything. I don't, I know it. From Eric, that well, it came minute. from Gary, but it was what? not in anything that passed. Okay, well, but what passed? Something passed. They, On the floor, there was section one D. Section one D uh, <coughs> has some changes to possession of a dangerous or deadly weapon in a school bus, school building, or in school property. Yeah. On yep. page twenty-six of twenty-eight. Starting on page 26, 
they changed. Well, they didn't do anything. They just changed. Oh penalty. no, they changed the penalty from three years to five years. Well, what's that for? Huh? On what? They made them feel good. Oh. <laughs> what did you give back? I don't know what else it did. <laughs> I mean, with regard to whom? Whoever threatened. possessed a dangerous or deadly weapon in a school bus or in a school building or in a school property. With the intent to injure another person. With the intent oh. to injure. So, so, there's, there's so they made an enhanced felony. Yeah. Yeah. Current yeah. law is current law in 4004. Mm -hmm. We passed yeah. about 2000, I think, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. And we had it a three year felony. Fine, not more than five grand, and they jacked it up to five years, and then said dangerous or deadly weapon has the same meaning instead of defined as set forth. I don't know if this is good, bad, or different, but that's what they did. I'm not sure. I'm on as passed by the house. This is six seven five. As passed by the house, page twenty six, section one d. I believe, I think that what they had done was they were making an enhancement. They, they moved the first right. offense from misdemeanor to felony, and then they moved the, they did an enhancement. Right. Uh, they went to, for the, I forgot, I, yes, in B, they went <coughs> for a first offense three years, and for a second offense five. I just want me this. I gave mine to John. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah I got it. Okay. So that's just, just note that the subsection A is if you have a, a weapon, on, a firearm on school property. Subsection B is that you have a firearm and you have an intent to injure another person. Yeah. So that's where you have the felony level. Well, what you should do, I think what you should do, Senator, I mean, uh, Director, um, <laughs> is to change, is to look at this section of law. Let's see if I go for that. And work with this section of law rather than what you had in here. Okay. So that that's what they did uh, in their version of so they, um, which got lost because nobody knew they did it because they were concentrating on making the Senate look bad. Well, you know, it's it's, it's interesting because you know they have you know federally you, you know you had the. Uh, even I think it was even in the No Child Left Behind, which we always, yeah. you know, that one, like they had some language in there, plus the previous gun bill uh, during the school, uh, school properties. But I, I think this, and in fact, this may be cleaner if we, you know, well, I think you can play around with that and get it, your threatening language in there. But yes. Then there is section three, which might enter into your representation of the sheriffs. And that is, I, I think, what they're trying to say is, if we have a school, if they, if the school resource officer happens to be a retired uh, law enforcement officer, they want that person to be uh, able to uh, have possess a weapon or a firearm. And I would think that it sounds like a good idea. Sounds maybe. fine to me. So, so everybody could hire somebody. Can I just, just ask a question about teachers. that? Are they yeah. going to be certified? Yes. Yes. I think I think that's well, well, so that word well, needs to be yeah. in there. Yeah. So why would you put yeah. retired instead of? Yeah, I didn't. I, I had nothing to do with well, this. This is Gary Vee. So well, they have a lot of retired people. Well, I know, I but use, yeah, but I think with Jeanette, I or Jeanette's going back. I, I'm just. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, Senator. I interrupted you. Yeah, I'm just saying right, that so. it, it says here that if they're qualified retired law enforcement officer. What if they're not retired? What if they yeah. work part time and they're, they're already in included? No. no. Yeah, they're working there now. No, if they're not working there now, so they still would be eligible because that people can those people can already work there and continue to. This doesn't stop them. It, this just adds someone. Mount Anthony, the Southwest Supervisory Union. Okay. I... Hired a former police officer to be the head of their security. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what he does, but he's the head of security. I don't know if he's allowed to carry a firearm, mm -hmm. but I would prefer to see the words licensed or qualified certified. or certain. No, li license. We're licensing certain. police officers because now. We license now? License. I need to get back up here. Can well. I so love to speak up? We, well, we passed a bill the other day moving it to, so now you go to the academy and you get certified, just like you go to nursing school and you get your degree. Then you apply for your license. It's the same. 
being treated as the same as other professions. Director of the state's attorney. So, well, so, and I'm, because I'm aware of the bill that was passed by and is currently in the House. So I think what we would do is um, use, because I think the certification, and if they go to licensing, if that's the term that actually passes um, through um, the final, you know, whatever comes agreement is made yeah. um, with you got with you all between the two government ops, that's what we use. Because the one thing we don't want to have is we don't want to have a law enforcement officer, because we can't decertify at this point in time, you know, having who may have had some uh, mental health issues. Technically a 95-year-old police officer, retired officer, could be considered the resource officer, and he may be qualified under this, but may not be physically able to. Well, it, we don't know what qualified means I mean, here. I guess qualified are, says nothing. There are a lot of school resource officers already, and I don't know what their status is with regard to departments, there's, but. There's fewer and fewer school resource officers. It's one of the things that was cut by the Vermont State Police. The Vermont State Police had, used to have several. All those were cut, and, mo and a lot of schools have gone to hiring a sheriff to patrol yeah. outside the building. I believe that's what Parkland did actually too. But in Mount Anthony, they patrol outside, but they're not resource officers because, you know, they just they just walk around to make sure that there's no unsavory characters going into the school. Now, Otter Valley, where my daughter teaches, <coughs> they have their person inside the yeah. school. Yeah. So that's that's probably a school me. resource officer, but yes. I know yeah. Um, Peel used to have one budget cuts. They, I don't believe they do yeah, anymore. And, and with cops and schools, a lot of schools lost them. You know, they used to have the state right. police at Mill River, I know. Yeah, that, that's what but I That was cops in school. I don't know. Well, but he was, he, he was a state trooper. told me, he, I know, by Cacciatore. Yeah, Cacciatore, yeah. And he was, but he considered himself a school resource yes. officer. But he was there with the state police car. Well, I know, it was the state police. <laughs> but, he, but the state police had a grant. Yeah, right. They had a grant called Cops in schools. Right. 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 But yeah. at any rate, my point, my point here is that's just, most of us feel it's, a, I would assume most of us feel it's a poor idea to arm teachers. Yeah. On the other hand, if schools were able to hire yeah. either retired as long as they're licensed officers or whatever the term might be in order to perform duties of a resource officer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <coughs> no, I don't want to do it. Really? And this yeah. just gives that authority to somebody who, and I don't know if they already have it or don't, as long as they uh, I'll, ch I'll check into it because I think what the goal is here, you know, he wants uh, Representative Bean sounds like he wants to again off make sure that somebody who I think is retired can do it. I think he may have offered it on the floor or withdrawn it or I don't know, but I think you need to make sure that whoever is a school resource officer is, is fully certified and, and I think you know the, we can work with language with the um, I've got the whole group of people in meeting with them today actually with the yeah with with the ones from your your uh, bill uh, so the the, ca the academy uh, state police uh, all better not start anyway. well that's that, I'm, that's not my fight I'm just I'm just gonna have it I have to, to be meeting with them so I I can I believe I can provide well, language I, that will I, satisfy I everyone think, unless the committee is absolutely opposed to this think it's worth doing but doing it right yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. I, I think I mean I think it's fine we yeah. just need to make sure yeah. we have the right language there just ask a question. do you know I don't know whether or not the law that prevents a weapon from being on school grounds is there any federal legislation that in, is involved there uh, there there is that is federal legislation but I believe that they exempt uh, law enforcement and um, you know, I know, and the school resource officers all came out of like when they after Columbine. That's usually right. when you first got. Just want to make school. sure we dovetail properly. Yes, and I have that actually. That's currly right. being printed. So I was over walking. We'll around. work on this next Tuesday, and presumably <coughs> Eric will be done with guns. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Yeah. So, Senator, then, uh, if I just want to make sure that my charge, I have my charge correctly, is that charge I Charge is to rewrite sections two and three, yeah. and defend section one as to why it's necessary. We have a copy of uh, 7554, 
and it looks like G currently is placed a defendant program of community-based electronic monitoring. And I don't know if this strikes G or adds a G, but there's already a G in 7554A. Can we entertain at least if you're going to work on section one? So that might need to be rewritten as well. Well, I'm, I'm just looking at 7554. There's already a G. No, but it's uh, subdivision. It's two. So you have to look because two, it's A2 is the analysis for the protecting the public. A1 is oh, for oh, the uh, assured I appearance. It. I misread the law. So. Why I'm not an attorney. So, I'm, so D, something. there'd be a new G here under L. Right. A2 B is where they order right. the right. But they order it under D, but they now would order it. Okay. 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 I think the whole thing was just an excuse. This is the first time that I've seen. Maybe Auburn has a different view, but I know that's okay. I don't care. I, I, I think. If I work with you also, uh, uh, all that I'm looking to try to do is bring a nexus between that provision and the charge being a violent crime. I don't know why we would remove weapons from somebody who's charged with a simple assault to a friend. Michelle, would you explain to the committee what you just explained to me? Um, they do it under, if you pay, turn the page to page two or four of the handout is on um, 7554. Um, you go to page two, they do it under D now. So for the analysis around, um, first they do the you know, conditions to ensure appearance, then they go on to subdivision A2, which is the top of the handout second page. So if the judicial officer determines that conditions of release imposed to assure appearance will not reasonably protect the public, the officer may impose an additional least restrictive of the following conditions or least restrictive of the combinations that will reasonably ensure protection of the public. And so the, the testimony uh, previously on this was that you know, they do see it and the judges do use that authority under A2D, which is the catch-all language about impose any other condition found reasonably necessary to protect the public. Um, and that they do sometimes order somebody not to possess firearms during that period. And I think the Attorney General's office testified over there and they said they see it sometimes, but it tends to be in personal assault cases or things like that. And I know the courts actually do it now. Right. We're now moving to codify it. If you have the chance to codify it in a way to make sure some judge sitting on a bench decides, I don't know, they're having a bad day or something, and they've got a DUI case in front of them, and they decide that uh, since the person had a gun at home and the car walked in, but it was never taken out of use, I don't want to have that coming in to haunt us. And I think they would have to have somebody could challenge it and say it's not the least restrictive condition. If there's nothing that indicates that the public is at risk, then I... I agree with you. I think that language ought to be in this provision somehow to make nexus between what but it, it is but it is in the meeting <coughs> or you can do it again you're not comfortable with the lead in no, 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 no. I'll let if Matt comes to the conclusion he's okay with it I'm not going to stand in the way but I think well, this is an opportunity let's, uh, to grab something wait till next Tuesday and I sound your name fairly clear and Senator Nick is concerned about the DUI case not having an imposition of a, of a requirement that completely has nothing to do with the crime. I mean, you can well, certainly that say that, that, that they, shouldn't, but yeah. they shouldn't be possessing a, a vehicle. <laughs> well, that's true. It could be argued as far as I'm concerned. But, yeah, but driving shouldn't drive, but that's personal opinion. But uh, well, that shouldn't drive. DUI sixes and yeah. well, since we're talking about possessing a firearm, possessing a vehicle, you see the, the the girl who ran into the was doing her driver's test, ran into the office of the motor vehicle oh, car, no. and <laughs> drove right through the car. Oh no! They they suggested she needed more training to get a license. 
luckily nobody was in here. She actually drove right into the, you know, it was like a motor vehicle with a plate glass window. And she drove right in. She drove right in. Right in. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward with people that there's no restriction on age of driver's license, and I, um, I've seen that a few times that, uh, when people have gone to. I forgot where that happened, but it was, it's kind of, oh you know, talk about having a bad day. So you might say to her, condition of release, is she not drive or possess a motor vehicle? Can I ask, just because I wasn't here when you first started that, was there um, some case that where a judge did order that in a DUI case? We have no idea. Okay, well, okay, I mean, you were just, just concerned about yeah. it. Senator right. Nick would come talk with <laughs> That's good because we need to deal with the water. Well, things haven't changed. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Just wait. John, look at me. Just look at me. I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay. All right. Oh, Alice, that is just so wonderful. That is so perfect. It was a gift to me. I don't know why, but yes, <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm all in favor of going in this direction. Yeah. I mean, we help. It won't adults. fit in the drawers. I think, I think we've big. worked towards the mental health 221. I would like to get out of here with something. I think for tomorrow's discussion on number yeah. one, section I, eight of I think I know S55, that certainly is appropriate to have out in room 11. <laughs> Oh. Even though you can't oh. eat the fluff. Oh. I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, that might fan the flames. Might fan the flames. A little too much. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, uh, and then. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Have that yeah. Any, any suggestions you, you would like them I think to? I would like to see, um, and you can work with Eric and Michelle on a redraft, um, see what we can come up with. Uh, Meet your goal. We actually, I, I like the idea of having more school resource options yeah. available. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can see it. Yeah. I know of several required retired cops in my area who would probably love to volunteer mm -hmm. to do that. Um, you know, as long as they're still They still qualified. have to keep up their so license. They would have to keep up their license. Mm -hmm. um, we have retired doctors who work at the uh, clinic the mm -hmm. uninsured in Bennington, right. they keep up their license. Right. But they're not working, you know, they don't have regular <coughs> patients, but. Um, it would, the reason why you wouldn't see some of the retired ones, actually, I believe, would be a concern for their actual retirement, because as you know, if you're a state employee, if you, um, if you work well, X hours, so maybe they volunteer. I can tell you this, though, that would be an interesting, I think you would be able to get more recent retirees yeah. uh, if we were able to, I don't know if this is possible, maybe Senator White knows, uh, if we were able to amend the, um, uh, I don't know if it's regulation, part of the retirement to where it would allow a recent retiree from, VS, let's say, VSP to uh, act as a school resource officer and that income would not, because um, now if you start working, then your, your retirement stops at that point um, until if you're oh, working at excess sorry, hours, thank you. and then I, I think that there that that wouldn't apply if you're doing a part-time resource officer or something. It's, if you are working for the state, if yeah. you if you work for the state, then then your retirement stops. But I don't think if you're working for somebody else that it does. I may okay. be wrong, but check that out. Yeah, I'll check that out. Okay. Well, I, I figured that because the schools that would be school resource that would be public school would be. Because they work for municipal departments and chair and work stuff. And I not the way the bill by asking for a stops. committee conference. Who's that from? What? I, I, I'm telling you, the world has. <coughs> I think that was your wife just basically wanting you home early. So. <laughs> no, it's actually, you know, I've said there were three choices. And that. one would be a committee conference, which is normal for a bill. Now they're, now the. Uh, it's Gun sets people evidently are out there, or some group is out there, do not delay passage by a public hearing or a conference committee. In other words, just concur with the House. We usually Student. do that. We usually just concur with the House. Yeah. I don't ever remember having things added to a bill in this manner and us just concurring and oh, not no. holding a committee of conference on any bill, no matter how small, no matter how trivial. 
that's just that the public. Well, people don't understand. It's frustrating right, right, to get a hundred emails every afternoon because the house is doing their thing. And, um, but people don't out there don't understand. I understand. They don't. They don't. But it's frustrating. I mean, to watch half the people in my district still think I go to Washington D.C. and that I get paid big bucks. And so why do, do I drive an old car? As a chair of the committee, don't you get? Paid? Yeah. Oh, we get a lot more. Don't uh, we? Uh, they don't know about. Yeah. But, oh, we're on TV. You're going to find out now. Huh? We get more for being a chair. Well, you get a lot more for being a in, in New York, in New York, the the a couple of years ago when I looked yeah. at the base oh, salary, it was 85. But you got an additional 25 if you were chair of the committee. Right. Or if you were minority leader or a ranking member. Or minority leader, we have to pay. <laughs> you have to pay. All right. So thank you very much. I'll stick around with the next And the next bill is human trafficking. Um, subject near and dear to our hearts. We have passed a lot of laws on human trafficking. I didn't know there was anything left. Yeah. So maybe uh, uh, Representative <coughs> Sullivan, who is the sponsor of the bill, could, oh. Oh. could tell us what we missed or what's changed that needs to be added to current law. Were you guys from the House actually sitting here listening while we commented on the House? Oh, yes, yeah, they were. were. <laughs> you, you disagree? <laughs> I, I heard your speech on Saturday night. Yeah. That's good. OK, thanks. Let's not go back there. No, we, we won't. But I was there until 7.30 waiting for my guy to go home. I was out of the house. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, please go ahead. The bill is 8603. Right, thank you. And Representative Buckles is the sponsor as well. And on the legal side, of course, I'm going to let uh, Representative Buckles go with her um, analysis and why we brought this bill. My part is that I've worked with so many victims who've been attacking over many, many years. And um, just in Vermont alone, we have had over 222 calls, and we've already had cases 44 and better. And I'm talking about the sex trafficking side does not include the labor trafficking side and does not include uh, the blend. So those are just the cases that have started that we're aware of from specific uh, hotlines. There are many more as well, and um, the need for getting human trafficking victims who have had children while they were groomed and brought through is where we're going with this as well, and um, anonymous. Because when you're groomed, you can be groomed and indoctrinated at a younger age and still be part of the trafficking organization as you mature to adulthood or you can even be groomed as an adult and the result of course comes with further grooming and guerrilla tactics and we need to assist these people to move out and get on with their lives and hopefully their children can have some benefit. So on the legal side I'm going to pass the buck to you <laughs> Representative Buck Holtz. I, I would imagine you were all part of passing the exception to parent-child contact that have to do with sexual assault victims who have a child. Yep. And so we see this as sort of an extension of that very important exception. Um, generally, you know, our policy is maximum contact with both parents for all children that's safe and appropriate. And in this situation, it could be neither. Um, with a trafficked mom and the child that resulted from that relationship. So um, I've never, I mean, I've had many cases as an attorney where I wish we could have had no contact. And what we, the best we can end up with usually is a lot of hoops for the perpetrating parent to jump through, but there's always the possibility. And this is not a situation. I would respectfully submit where that would be appropriate under any circumstances. Um, and the only other portion that we asked to have changed had to do with annulments, um, where 
uh, annulments currently cannot be granted where the um, a husband and wife, or wife and wife, or husband and husband live together um, consensually. But you, you, when you've got so much coercion and uh, mind manipulation as you get in human trafficking situations, uh, I think it's an easy leap to see that no one could give their consent under those circumstances. So those are the two components. And if you have any questions, please ask. Yes. First off, let me just suggest that this will become one of the questions on the bar exam for some future board law student. Um, he curses, it's okay. Yeah. We had him. <laughs> the, um, the issue of whether or not voluntary cohabitation is eliminated, how do you prove then? I'm trying to articulate the right question. I think I see where you're going. The theory is yeah. that, that they have been coerced. We presume that they've been coerced. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that I am comfortable yet accepting why that change should be made to make that presumption. OK. Are you saying generally it shouldn't be made? Would you well, be more generally, comfortable with specific? Generally speaking, right now, we have a moment of They've been cohabitating, that mm -hmm. by itself is evidence that there was no coercion. Mm -hmm. You're asking to eliminate that altogether, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to wrap my head around how we do Okay, how do we make that leap? Well, first off, it's not always cohabitating by choice. Okay, there's a paradigm that has to be met in the human trafficking area of that they must have been there by fraud for some coercion. So that parameter would have to be proven before the annulment would be granted anyway. So it's not like, gee, I was trafficked and I'm going to stay with you now by choice. So this is an entirely different level that has to be proven when they go through the court system and asking for that annulment when they're a human trafficking victim. Um, and of course, you know, there's always the hope that the trafficker will come forward and argue against it and <laughs> then we can have a great defense against the uh, trafficker, but the chances of that happening are very slim. Um, but there is a paradigm that must be met because they must really prove that they are victims of human trafficking. So this isn't just, you know, a free card. So if Party B wants the annulment, raises the grounds that they were threatened by force or other form of coercion or deception by a third party hmm. who we identify as the trafficker. If the spouse objects, does their defense then become, how do we combat that that actually happened? So, I'm going. so in this situation, are we presuming that the other sp the spouse. Spouse A does not want to get an right. annulment. Spouse B is seeking an annulment on the grounds that they were forced right. or coerced, but the coercion was caused not by spouse A, but by third party human traffic. So the spouse in this situation doesn't know that this person's been trafficked? I suppose that's one thing they can Right. I, I, th I think that's pretty unusual, and again, I'm going to go back to her experience in this area, um, but I think usually y you know someone gets delivered to you as the spouse. Well, and, and it's kind of an arranged marriage in a different culture. I mean, are you talking about that? Well, well um, no. Not that, exactly, no. but mm -hmm. I mean, that could be a situation that happens, but that's an entirely different okay. um, arena. As far as the person who spouse a and the spouse B, the trafficker, say, caused this union, um, then there would be that correlation between the A, the John, or the person who's placed there to control that spe uh, specific spouse to continue being indoctrinated through this grooming process. So there would be a correlation, and 
bring the trafficker in <coughs> to say that they had nothing to do with it. And, you know, so it's going to be a hearing. It's not going to be just, you know, a file for an annulment like you go to Vegas and the signs up there. No, but if you use Alice as a day mm -hmm. of arranged mm -hmm. marriage, sure. for instance, mm -hmm. I, I think there's an argument to be made in America that an arranged marriage is a form of coercion. In other cultures, that's not necessarily the case. And so if they come here after having been married, spouse B says, I was pushed into this by my parents, but they've been cohabitating for 10 years or whatever the case may be, and is now using that as the grounds for the annulment. Am I missing something, or is there a potential problem there? Because part spouse there is, A yeah. had nothing to do necessarily with what happened with the parents in the arranged marriage, other than they were doing what their cultural norms are. Um, so you have now spouse A trying to defend, and I'm, I'm just wondering how this plays out. So my my thought would be having done some of these cases and you know with people who do have arranged marriages yeah. still must meet the paradigm of human trafficking, the force, fraud, and coercion. So th those are the three elements. Okay? Um, we can't redefine. <coughs> Um, if you have an arranged marriage, it could be just fine. It doesn't mean you were trafficked. Okay, it really doesn't. You have to meet those elements to prove that, in fact, you were one trafficked. You're saying one of Well, they have to meet force, fraud, and coercion for it to be the true human trafficking on the arranged marriage side. So that's the paradigm. So if you have to meet one single element, and I'm going to let the lawyers do that, you know, there's going to be a fact finding. Um, but the actual human trafficking paradigm does include force, fraud, and coercion, not war. But I will let the lawyers step in and say no. It's well, or, <coughs> what I'm wondering, um, on the basis of what Senator Banks bringing up, is if we went too far taking out the last sentence. That's what I'm thinking. Yes. Bring it back in. Yeah, because I think we're okay in the first edition. But this, this may have taken us too far to say under no circumstances so can it be annulled. On page can two. I, Sorry, yeah. Can I ask a question about that too? Mm -hmm. Because this section does not deal with human trafficking. Yeah. Am I right? I mean the whole the whole force or fraud. So so if I'm not specifically, right. But it, so it fits in that. So sure. if I've yeah. been living with um, this guy for ten years mm -hmm. and then we decide to get married and then I decide he's a jerk, mm -hmm. this would say um, that I could get well, an anomaly. Let me hold some of these right. questions for Bryn to, okay. to walk right. through. I, okay. I just wanted to, have, I, I usually don't have House members in um, for this very reason. Um, I, I don't think they need to defend the House no. members. No. So why don't we just have Bryn and walk through? Okay. I thought okay. I'd just present my Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Join the group, Joe. Yeah. Yep. So should I tell the person that doesn't want to sell guns to Democrats, uh, with the young woman at the um, thing on Saturday in Putney had this sign, and across the bottom it said, Democrat, pro 2A. What? Makes sense. Pro Second Amendment. She's a Democrat, oh, oh, and she's oh. pro the Second Amendment. So. This is all anyway. generated by We the People of Shaftesbury, by the way. We the People of Shaftesbury. It's a group, it's a group of, um, that expect us to do whatever they want. It's called We the People of Shaftesbury. That's, that's oh, yeah, I, I started reading that when I deleted it. Alice Miller's so, group. You and are all a little punch drunk if you haven't figured that out. So, Bryn. Uh, it's hard to concentrate here. Um, the House did a strike call amendment, I assume? Yes. I think that's right. So, can you walk us quickly through it? Sure thing. I think Representative Sullivan and folks were trying to walk us through it, and I think it's more appropriate for you to do it. Okay, sure thing. So, for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. So, I think that the committee already got that the gist of the bill is really, it's in two parts. We've got the annulment section, which is section one, and then we've got um, two and three, which really deal with parent-child parent contact. And those are the parts that talk specifically about human trafficking. Section one doesn't speak specifically about human trafficking, rather it talks about how um, force or fraud plays into annulment of marriage. So currently, so section one, currently under uh, 516, which is the annulment um, based on force or fraud statute. Um, within the annulment subchapter of the annulment and divor divorce chapter, provides that um, if consent of a party to marriage was obtained by force or fraud, uh, the marriage can be annulled, essentially unless the parties voluntarily cohabited, cohabitated before um, the commencement of the action. So what section one does is two things. It broadens the scope of marriages that can be annulled under this uh, force or fraud statute to include those marriages um, where consent was obtained by the threat of force or other forms of coercion or deception. And again, as the um, sponsors of the bill indicated, it removes that restriction that marriages um, shall not be annulled if the parties voluntarily cohabitate, cohabitated prior to the commencement of the action. So two things um, to the annulment statute. Well, the amendment says that you're crossing that out, right? Right, so that's currently, um, Currently, there's a requirement that um, a marriage can't be annulled on grounds of force right. or fraud if there was that yeah. voluntary. So now they will be able to be. Right. So that, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll move on to section two. So now we're moving to um, this is a rights and responsibilities order. <clears throat> Again, we're still in the annulment and divorce chapter. So currently, this uh, section of law sets out how the court makes the parental rights and responsibilities order including a requirement that the court look to factors regarding the best interests of the child. So the whole statute is in here, but if you turn to page four, you'll, um, this is the part that has the amendment. So under existing law, um, under F1, this provides that uh, a court can deny a parent-child contact with a parent if the court finds, that, finds evidence that the parent was convicted of sexually assaulting <coughs> the parent and the child was conceived as a result of that assault. You'll remember um, that from a few years ago. So what this bill does is it expands that provision and it allows the court to deny parent-child contact when one parent was convicted of human trafficking and the other parent was the trafficked victim. And then if you turn to page five, um, this is subdivision F2, and under existing law, this provides that a court can deny parent-child contact if the court finds by clear and convincing evidence that the parent was, um, that the parent was, that one parent was assaulted by the other parent and the child was conceived as a result of that assault. And in addition, that terminating parent child contact would be in the best interest of the child. That doesn't have to be the child. Well, it yes. Well, the trafficker is not. Yeah, so, so that was the, I was just talking about existing law. So what, what it does here, what, we, what we've added is that the moving parent was trafficked by the non-moving parent um, under the human trafficking what, statute. What if the person who impregnated the person who was being trafficked was not the human trafficker, but rather a 
compliant of the trafficker. Right. Then so it comes under current law. Right. So well, if there's not a proof, there's so you're right that it doesn't require that the trafficked um, the person who was uh, by clear and convincing evidence found to have trafficked the other parent be the actual parent of the child. Um, that's not a requirement under this change. That's a little weird. Other states in terms? I don't know about that. I can look into it. Hmm. So I would just my, mention my recollection from our work on human trafficking in the past. Usually the trafficker was uh, if the if the person being trafficked make that term. If the victim uh, was usually um, you know used for sexual purposes with a variety of individuals. So uh, and here you talk about parent. I'm wondering if it shouldn't be expanded to. Anyone making a claim? Right. We're focusing on the on whether or not the on person the is the parent. Should focus on the victim, I think, not on the. Because I, I, my recollection, and and we did a lot of work on human trafficking a few years back, and my recollection is that the traffickers are basically not involved, I mean, they're selling the, you know, prostituting the client. Many times they're in, um, the one that was suspected of being in Bennington was actually a woman who was the trafficker, who was trafficking other women. She immediately left the area when the, the heat got on. Do you remember the ads yeah. that yeah. they had? Yeah, sorry, I do. Mm -hmm. What does this section have to do with parents who are in court trying to get parent-child contact or custodial rights? I'm struggling to understand your hypothetical and how it fits here. Well, I don't know how the person would even know. So I'm wondering what, you know. I don't disagree with your underlying premise. I'm just trying to figure out how that trafficker would fit in here if they're not one of the parents well, actually seeking rights. talking about yeah. that Maybe I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the idea is that um, a victim who is trying to um, seek the rights and responsibilities for the child or terminate uh, rights and responsibilities for um, the other parent. If that victim proves that um, they were trafficked by that other parent, then um, they should be able to terminate uh, the contact between Why the parent and the child. Why wouldn't they be under the law? Well, I think this just provides a, a presumption that the court would order that termination. Well, if you could check on other states. Sure. So the other thing I would just point out is that the under F2, that provision that you don't have to necessarily be convicted of sexual assault, um, you just have to prove by clear and convincing evidence that the child was a result of that sexual assault. Um, similarly, uh, the, this bill expands that provision to allow the court to deny parent-child contact if it finds by clear and convincing evidence that the parent was trafficked. And, and by the way, we have a document on RFAs that don't think it belongs with this bill. No. Yeah. 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 I don't know which bill it was. I think there's a bill on I don't know the number. I'll, I'll grab it from your files after. Don't worry about it. OK. Thank you. So if there's no conviction, the court has to also find that the termination would, would be in the best interest of the child. That's the last thing. So section three, 
Um, now we move to the Adoption Act. Um, so this provision provides grounds for terminating the relationship of parent and child. Um, so a petition to terminate a parent-child um, relationship can be filed in a proceeding for adoption by a parent who selected a, a prospective adopted parent for a minor and who intends to place that minor um, with that person or a parent whose spouse has filed a petition to adopt the other parent's minor child or a prospective adoptive parent or an agency that has selected a prospective adoptive <coughs> parent. And so those are the circumstances under which um, what page are you on? So this, I'm just talking about a statute that's not in the bill, but I'm on page six. Oh. So we're under grounds for terminating the relationship. Oh. And those are the circumstances under which a petition could be brought here. Same as if you were doing an adoption. Right, right. So the statute grants the court authority um, to order the termination of parental relationship under certain circumstances. For example, when the parent has been convicted of a crime of violence and the facts of the crime indicate that the, that the parent's unfit to maintain a parent-child relationship. So what the change here provides that the court can order termination if the parent committed a sexual assault resulting in the conception of the child. And you can find that language on page eight. Well, that doesn't say a child, that says a child. Yeah. So if a no, child a has child. been conceived in some other relationship, right. this, then would this would enable that yes. son or daughter of the accused to terminate their relationship? It would enable, um, that would be grounds under which the court could terminate um, the relationship. Yes, between that child, between another child and that parent. So, so it, it, but the word uh does not limit it to the child. Right. Yes. So I have two kids. If I'm convicted of forcefully impregnating a total stranger, my kids could then petition the court, or my spouse could petition the court to have my parental rights terminated? The spouse could, and this is again under the Adoption Act, so this is um, if the parent, if your spouse is filing an order um, at, because they have selected an adopted parent. So this is, um, this would be a situation when a, a parent is looking to put their, um, to have put their child up for adoption and they're seeking to terminate the rights mm. of the other parent. <clears throat> Well, would it not apply in the case of um, someone's been married, they have a child, they get divorced later on, a spouse, a former spouse, um, gets a sexual assault on a child conviction, then the remaining parent could then automatically, I mean, would it be pretty much automatic that the, say they got together with somebody new that that person could adopt the child? No, this is, this would not be automatic. I mean, this is okay. the, where's the stuff? That's so the court this ha the court has to hold a hearing, mm -hmm. and if the court finds upon clear and convincing evidence that um, mm -hmm. that one of those grounds exists, is that in here? Where yes, it is. So that's on page six, sort of the mm -hmm. um, the the sub sub subsection A there sets out the grounds on on which that the court has to consider in making this determination. So if one of these um, grounds exists and the court finds it's in the best interest of the minor, then the court has to terminate. Has so to. Shall terminate. But again, that's based on the finding of the best interest of the child. So the court has to find, if you look at, um, all right, so this, this, never mind, this could apply um, to any age of child. This one still with best interest of the child applying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
it's a subdivision under A, so it's one of the grounds that the yeah. court um, okay. it's always in there. Thought on the? Did you have a thought on the um, arranged marriage? If an arranged if an arranged marriage could be annulled under Section One. Yes. Yeah. I think that it's really it's really up to the court to find whether an arranged marriage would fit um, the definition of mm -hmm. threat of force or other forms of coercion or deception. Mm -hmm. Voluntary cohabitation has traditionally been used as a defense to one of the current uh, standards of force or fraud. Now we're expanding the definition of force or fraud and curtailing the normal defense to that as far as cohabitation is concerned. Using Alice's analogy, if in a foreign country an arranged marriage was made with 11-year-old girl by her parents and she ends up married and then comes to this country, passes the age of 18 and lives with the spouse. Um, in this country, I would say that an arranged marriage with an 11-year-old is something that could be argued to be a form of coercion at the very least and possibly something else. Over there, it was not. Here it is. Now she goes by the age of 18 and doesn't do anything about it for five or six years, and then suddenly wants to get an annulment. Um, and we're removing the cohabitation defense altogether, as I understand. So in that scenario, the person who is defending If the husband wanted to defend and say, no, it wasn't coercion because we lived together all this time, simply that's no longer available as a defense. Um, I would agree with you that it's not, it would no longer be um, an absolute defense, but I don't think there's anything that would prohibit the court from considering whether the parties voluntarily cohabitated in determining whether or not the marriage was obtained through force or fraud or coercion or deception. Well, the judge doing any kind of research would look at this language being added at the same time as removing the cohabitation clause, so I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head wondering how would a judge then go back and revert to the belief that there is a defense on cohabitation? You mean he or she may draw some inference about the legislative intent? I, I think that's a fair game. Um, yes. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Please? Yep. So, with regard to um, page eight, then, with regard to the respondent has committed a sexual assault resulting in the conception of a child, um, this this could this apply also, or does it apply also within the, within the situation of a married couple and there's a and so the married couple has a child who maintained that it's rape within a marriage. So this really could then stop that person who's convicted of that from having contact with wind up with their children, at least for adoption of other children that were already born within that marriage. Rape within a marriage. Yeah. Um, I don't think it, I, I see that that could be a possibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything would prohibit that. Okay. As long as you're assuring me that there's an, the interest of the child who would be the person who might be subject to now not seeing a parent. Yes, I mean, it's in, you know, subdivision A says that if the court has to find that one of these grounds exists based on clear and convincing evidence and that termination is in the best interest of the child. 
So just to be clear, this all falls under the statute of terminating the relationship between parent and child. In a petition to terminate, as I understand it, can be brought by a parent or guardian. The parent whose spouse has filed the petition or before to adopt the parent's minor child, the prospective adoptive parent of the minor child has filed a petition, or the agency that has selected a prospective adoptive parent for the minor and intends to place. So if DCF has in custody a child that they want to place with a given adoptive placement, they can use as grounds under this the fact that the parent who's objecting to that was convicted of producing a child in a rape situation. Yes. Uh, not this child, but some other child. As currently written, yes. State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and here on behalf of the uh, questions or regarding questions that might come up under my State's Attorney's hat. And let me just start off by, if I may, Senator and Senator, this is not done. I, I do support this bill, and, and I think that um, one of the um, one of the crimes that is probably most misunderstood and greatly underestimated to me in the state of Vermont is human trafficking. You know, we went, well, when this bill was passed and we worked on it, uh, uh, it was, uh, I think it was, a, it was a great move toward um, recognizing that uh, there are people out there that are being used as, um, in order for other people just to make money and to make fi have financial gain. And uh, as we know, it, it is, um, uh, some people have referred to as a form of slavery, and which I would concur with in most situations. Um, you know, I see it as uh, two areas. You know, the, the human trafficking can either come in a situation in the service area here in Vermont, where there are some people who have um, you know, bring people from other countries to work on farms. They uh, they can uh, through coercion or uh, deception bring them on, make them come here, work on the farms not get paid or get paid little, uh, and not just farms, it's also uh, you know, hotels, uh, it's uh, anything where you find a service type of industry where, where you have uh, people that uh, could be here in, uh, brought into this country illegally and that's held over their, their, uh, their head. Uh, that's one area, but there's the other area is one where I think is probably the one that uh, goes under the radar, and that is in the area of prostitution. You know, most people will look at prostitution and they'll say, come on, it's a victimless crime, and let's just go ahead and, uh, you know, you go on, move on to other things. Um, I can't tell you, a, one of the times when I was in, actually, Windsor County, and I would have, um, I remember the first three cases that I that I received from uh, then State's Attorney mm -hmm. Canaan was the, where arrests came in for prostitution. and. Um, so I started looking into it a little bit further, and as I was, I said, Michael, I think there might be something more to this. And he says, you know, these are um, uh, crimes of prostitution. You know, uh, find out what you can. If you see, if you really think there's more, then go further. But understand this: is that 
you know, there are complaints coming that we're clogging up courts with, with smaller cases and that, you know, cases that should be, you know, give, just give an automatic diversion or just give them a fine and get them out of here. And um, because you just don't have the time to do <coughs> investigations because we don't really have the investigators if this is like, you know, local law enforcement might do a uh, sting, which they did in these cases. But what they miss, and because we don't have time to really go in and investigate these crimes, are uh, the fact that a lot of these women are, in fact, in relationships with individuals who actually have, uh, over a period of time, uh, coerced these women into the relationship first and then groomed them to the point where uh, they now um, it moves on to, listen, I need, we need to have some money to pay some of the bills. Uh, you need to get out there and do some work. And the stories, I don't have to, uh, Linda has um, already, uh, I believe, uh, laid the groundwork for that. And, and actually, I, I was, uh, I saw an entire presentation made by um, uh, Representative Sullivan, and it was an extremely moving, and that's really what opened my eyes before I got to deal with this one case. And uh, so, the, uh, after we dealt with uh, two of the cases where it didn't seem like there was much, um, I did start, I reached out on this one case uh, and finally found, uh, to make a long story short, I got in touch with the mother of the, the prostitute who was arrested. And it was a chilling story. And it was one where this person was a, an actual college graduate. And, um, and she, the mother told the story uh, of how she got involved in this relationship with this guy where they all thought he was a great guy and, and one thing led to another, then the drugs got involved. Uh, and then next thing you know, um, he uh, has her out there working on the street. And she came here uh, to Vermont. I, um, outside of my time with the state's attorneys, I, I ended up um, working with the mother and also the, the woman and, and got her into some treatment down and helped get her treatment down in Massachusetts. And um, she had one then later told a story about what had really happened. At uh, this time, she'd also been in touch with uh, some of the federal officials down in, in Massachusetts because that was where it was all came out of. They just came up here to Vermont. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is a situation where um, the crime is not as uh, irrelevant and it's not as, um, uh, I shouldn't say, it's, not, it's happening far more than what most of us think in this state. Uh, and we do have obviously a lot of things to worry about with the opioid issue, um, which is dovetailed in this, but also with the, the issues that we've just been dealing with, with regarding the violence. But any time that we're able to make some advances toward ending the relationships and the power and the abuse that one individual has over another, because it can be a man and it could be a woman, um, that's we're not only better as, uh, as a state uh, and in uh, what we're providing for our, for our folks, but I think we're also you know, better as, a, as, a, um, as an entire country to show that we will not, we're not going to stand by and let this, you know, let people be used and abused um, sexually or in other matters um, that are being done currently across this country. So. Uh, I would strongly suggest and urge that um, that the committee uh, uh, support the um, this termination of this bill and uh, what it's trying to do. And hopefully at one time when, when there are not a thousand different other issues that are facing you, immediate problems, uh, especially as a part-time legislature, uh, we'll be able to look further into ways that we could um, try to do more to end the, the um, what I consider the uh, prolific uh, uh, human trafficking trade here in Vermont. Um, I don't know if laws can solve certain problems. Uh, you know, we, we we passed, I think, some of the strongest human trafficking laws in the country. Uh, you know, law enforcement has stretched it. Joe was talking about a, a community in his district that's a school is 45 minutes from the nearest uh, law enforcement. Uh, I've got a similar school in Reedsboro. It takes 45 minutes for state police to get there. Um, you know, so if you're talking about 
an emergency and it takes 45 minutes, or if you have an investigation into human trafficking, um, you know, I don't know wherever it is, particularly in a rural state like Vermont on the border of, of Quebec, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New York, you know, these fo folks move very quickly. And so I'm, I'm not sure it's legislation as much as making it a priority of law enforcement and others to investigate the cases. I don't know what, you know, I mean, I'm fine with this bill, but I don't know what gets us there other than the resources and the resources to do it. I mean, fighting an opiate problem or fighting a, other problems. Um, and, and then we sit here spending our time talking about. Well, I, I do think that the laws that we have are good laws and we could use them. The problem, let me give you kind of an example. I actually just looked quickly to see what the numbers were. And uh, last year, I think there were, we had six convictions for human trafficking, but 909 um, cases of prostitution that came in that quickly got dumped into diversion. Um, and so, if there were, if there were, and, and I know there, there were others because I know that there are, there are states, attorney's offices that don't even, they can't, they don't have the time to take the prostitution cases. So they don't, they don't even put them to diversion, they just go ahead and dismiss them. Um, or they won't take them from law enforcement. But if you figure there's been, a, let's say, a thousand cases where you know we have done something, got some involved, I, and this is just my personal um, involvement, I, I would, I would hazard to guess that uh, a good number of those had to deal with people that were being trafficked, uh, trafficked by, uh, by third parties, uh, whether it be a significant other or being you know some other type of uh, organized crime. Uh, gang or, or um, group. So, but the, we, the laws are here. We just need, again, the resources, which I know that that's a problem and has been. I think it's more than even just the resources, and I hate to sound like a, I know, I'm sorry I wasn't here for that conversation, but the first time I ever became aware that this was even an issue, I mean, I'm such a, not even LA or whatever, but <clears throat> about it must, must have been about ten years ago now. There was a huge um, article in, I believe it was the New Yorker, and it was about a smallish town, you know, not a tiny town, but I would say, is somewhere in New York, and there was a house on the corner that um, had some young women living in it. Nobody paid too much attention to it. They, they would see the young women come down and go to the corner store and buy candy and, and stuff. And when they finally um, raided this house, the people who were uh, taking advantage of what was going on there, and these were all young girls who had been trafficked, were the upstanding community members, it just, it made me want to throw up. I mean, so we, as long- the community members were the patrons? Or yes. They, or they were the persons who were them? No, they were the patrons. They yeah. were the, all, it, it included, I mean, the ministers council and members and ministers and, and from the community and- Elliot Spitzer. <laughs> and, and so how all the laws, that exist aren't going to aren't going to change that that um, depraved bu human behavior, and I, I have to. It you, just you know, I, I. It's maybe it's not a great analogy to drug addiction and stuff, drug use, but the drugs the uh, people are going to seek drugs if they're addicted to drugs. Yeah. People who are, um, are using women in this way, they're going to continue to try to find that, but. That, and again, I understand I, your concern, but it's not one where I, I think that that just highlights <coughs> the need for us um, to protect these folks because they're being used and abused by people of power, people yes. who would try to stop us from using whatever little resources we have to convict them or to get these people out of their lives that they, if you want to call it a life, um, that they live. I have to say it made me look at everybody in my community. You know, a little jaundiced 
for a long time after that. Sorry. John, I've got two questions about the bill. Uh -huh. um, about the bill. Okay, answer. Well, page one, <coughs> removing the voluntary cohabitation. That language was initially put in this statute to provide a defense on what we are now expanding. And I'm wondering what the rationale is for doing that. I don't know that, um, and that uh, was not. Um, I, I don't. I just. I don't know. Where are you, Joe? This is page page one. one. Down here. Is that cool? The, the underlined words are expanding. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the concept, if you will, of what is fraud, or force, and the language that's crossed out is actually eliminating one of the defenses that was in existence prior to our expanding that concept. So I'm still scratching my head over that. You don't know the, the, yeah, the, I don't, the only thing that I could see here is that, that <laughs> while you, know, you might have voluntary cohabitation, cohabitation uh, until such time as you find, the person finds out and learns that, um, that there has been some fraud or that there was something that happened that um, they were told, that, let's say that they are with somebody that the partner uh, who said that they were Joe Smith was really uh, Dan Jones, who who uh, was a, um, uh, a serial, you know. So I mean, of course I'm being extreme here, but uh, that I that's where I think that um, why I would like to, I, I could easily see that that could cause a problem if that was in there. Uh, okay. So maybe you you know some language can be worked to make sure that those that if something is found out at a later time. Uh, after the voluntary cohabitation, that that would uh, still um, allow the person to come forward to the trust the, economic. Let me skip to page eight. Okay. New language is being added. If I follow this through correctly, I'm currently 61 years old. If at the age of 16 I had been convicted of a rape that resulted in a child, and I've served my debt to society, I've moved on, I now get into another relationship where a child is conceived. If I am reading this right at the age of 61, God forbid I ever got into that position at this age, but if I was, this automatically gives, as I read it, kind of strict liability against me being a parent. And it doesn't matter what child was born, if I had a, a another child with my wife and then my wife and I are now in the process of a divorce she hooks up with a new boyfriend she wants him to adopt it seems to me this automatically results in that happening and I'm a little concerned because if you read the lines just above there you see the facts of the crime or violation indicate that the respondent is unfit to maintain a relationship with parent and child with a minor seems to me some kind of language like that ought to be attached to number four and the word a should become the before child otherwise uh -huh. this is a wide open argument for somebody who's just pissed at their ex to say hey i want my new boyfriend to have this child be adopted and that language gives carte blanche opportunity for that to happen, if I see it right. Okay, so if I could, um, we're talking about page uh, eight. Uh, first, let me just say that termination uh, issues are not my forte, but, and I read this as you were reading, and, and first, I think you need to show us that you have to look to see that there are, these are reasons that can be used, but you still have to, uh, uh, prove that uh, in my clear and convincing evidence, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that this is going to still be in the best interest of the child. That they have to take into all sorts of uh, uh, circumstances uh, into consideration. But I also would say, again, maybe it's my quick interpretation here, but that you might already be caught under that anyway, under three. If that three is existing law, uh, where the respondent has been convicted of a crime of, of violence. And, uh, See, we're getting close to noon, and there is a number of questions here for this bill. And we didn't hear from Marshall, we didn't hear from Auburn, or anybody else that wants to speak on this bill. But we're in the hearing a number of concerns. 
times. I don't know if you can address them. Um, Rib did find that Tennessee and Mississippi have passed these laws, so certainly back into progressive legislation. I think it could be, I think it could be fixed, by the way, and very quickly. Um, so I'm sorry if I could just give you my what the thing yeah. I think I think Number the four. issue that that yeah. 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 Bryn knows how to fix these house problems. Yeah, just just in response to your statement, John, I know there has to be clear and convincing evidence that it's in the best interest of the child to do that, but if mom's new boyfriend happens to be a billionaire, there's a strong argument to make that this new <coughs> relationship is working in the best interest of this kid. So I'm, I'm a little leery that we don't have attached the language that appears at the end of the Section three. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I don't. I don't. Um, uh, I, I will let the the folks that um, do or the experts that maybe tell why that language is what it is. But as I said, I think that if you're convicted of a crime of violence, that you're under current law, you're, you're facing that. But it does say, and the facts of the crime or violation indicate that the respondent is unfit to maintain. Right. So there's um, a qualifier there. If you, okay. But there isn't a qualifier under four. Right. So that's why commas and periods and everything else are very important when we're drafting these laws. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Marshall, uh, can we take you up? Okay. Take up sure. your comments. Uh, quickly, or do you have long comments? No, no, no. I have very, very quick comments on this. Um, and that's because I, this doesn't, this impacts our area of practice in a very sort of, um, you know, kind of at the margins, which is to say, in doing juvenile law, um, I'm familiar with cases that have involved uh, juveniles in particular who have been trafficked. Um, and frankly, you know, we are supportive of anything that provides tools to address human trafficking that are outside of <coughs> the tools that we have now, because frankly, the tools we have now don't really work, um, particularly when we're talking about children victims. Um, you know, really the only thing that's available right now is the CHIN system, so taking kids into custody as either being, having been neglected or being beyond the control of their parents um, are sort of the two ways that uh, these kids often come into custody. And frankly, the, you know, the resources just aren't there. It's just not a good system for working with those youth. Um, so we don't object to anything. We don't object to this in concept. Um, we certainly are supportive of coming up with things that are not the chin system um, it, that help us to deal with this problem. As far as the sort of specifics of it, I'm not a domestic docket lawyer, um, and I never want to be. So when it comes to you know the, the application of Title 15, you're talking to the wrong person, and I'm going to defer on any questions that are really specifically about that. I think you've got to find somebody who's got a lot more experience in domestic talk at court to answer those questions. Um, I, you know, I do think that in any effort like this, there's there's always problems. You know, there's always ways that the wording could be tweaked, and always different ways that you can interpret it. And all I'm saying is I'm not the person to answer those questions. But I am here to say that we do support the concept of the bill broadly, um, and you know are really happy to see that there's an effort being made to address this in a way that you know provides some ways for people who want to get out of these situations to get out of these situations that doesn't involve turning to Department for Children and Families or turning to uh, prosecutors' offices because uh, you know that and this is anecdotal, but the sense that I get in working with some some of my clients who have been in these situations is that uh, those processes often are really not palatable to anybody involved, including you know the including the child victims a lot of the time, and who you know are not going to want to be part of a you know, state custody, not going to be put. You know, I mean, frankly, the the kids that I've dealt with who have been victims of human trafficking have been very sophisticated, very independent kids. Um, young people who really, if you met them and talked to them, you wouldn't think of them as young people. You would think of them as young, sophisticated adults. Um, and it's because when you're in a situation like this, you kind of grow up fast and you're exposed to a lot. And those are exactly the kind of 
people who really, uh, you know, state custody type of remedies really rub the wrong way. It's hard to get, it's hard to engage those clients in the system that we have in place. It's, you know, we just don't have the system that would engage those clients, so instead we try to shoehorn them into the system we have, and it just doesn't work. Um, so we're supportive of coming up with, you know, alternative angles to approach this problem, but as far as the specifics of what this does to Title 15 and what the domestic docket judges are going to do with it, that's not my area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There was a there was a couple in Clarendon. You know where Clarendon is to South Carolina. We go through there all the time. Well, they had a this wasn't a drug issue, but they had a situation going. Who knows what the background is behind it? But they were um, they were soliciting truck drivers, and you know then the, the, they go as a couple to where and they would ask the trucker to park someplace. And I was always wondering what this car was doing parked on a pull off, which I used to go by all the time. And I would see it there all the time, and there'd be a truck there. And later, somebody got arrested in it because they. Were, she was being prostituted or maybe voluntarily, I don't know, but they were a truck driver finally complained. You know, because they were extorting money from some of the truck drivers who had stopped, who they had connected with online, and they stopped. 